third one of these. All right, okay. I didn't do that. Is that right, you, I've Craig? It. I've done it. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for, for turning up for this uh, our third session. Um, uh, Craig's going to give us a, a little chat on how business schools um, can uh, help, I think, in terms of the COVID-19 or what it actually means in terms of business. Um, we hope to have this uh, session for one hour. Uh, if it takes less than that, fine, it takes less than that. Otherwise, um, it's all yours, Craig. Take it away. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. And just want to say thanks for organising this and sticking with it, because I think it's a great initiative. Um, you know, it punctuates the week a little bit, and everyone's got a, the opportunity to possibly put something in the in the ring. So I'm hopefully others will pick this up at the end of <coughs> today and, you know, send it, uh, Andrew some suggestions as to what they would like to do. Um, so I want to run over uh, some, I guess I'm still trying to come to terms with the work I've been doing over the last sort of five years and so it's, it's sort of retrospective uh, writing so I'm I'm using this as an opportunity to talk through some of the work I've been doing and also um, what I'm going to be um, what we yeah, are what I'm what I think are some of the things we might be able to do as a as a business school when it comes to the um, sort of the exit from the COVID-19 lockdown um, so I guess my sort of reboot the business business research is my general topic. Anyway, I thought I'd talk briefly um, just about some of the things that have been going on um, for me, my kind of bubble happenings, because it seems to me that one, one of the things that we miss when we're working on in an online environment is just all the sort of chit chat that we normally do with people, sort of things that have been going, going on for us, you know, how we're feeling about the world. All. And one of my sort of pet peeves over the last few weeks is that people have been emailing me with sort of really just business as usual stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, so we're actually sitting at home, you know, we're not actually doing any of that sort of face-to-face -face stuff. We're not really talking about interesting things or stuff that we're not really passing all, all the non-verbals that you get from actually talking to people face to face so you could you know when people email you and say you know you know do this you kind of think hang on let's just start but just back up a little bit and see if we can get a little bit more of um you know a sense of who we are so i thought well, well I'll, I'll just tell you a little about some of my little bubble happenings over the last couple of weeks that i've been doing um i mean for us we, it's been quite a bit of a change really we we thought we'd got rid of the um our uh, our our, our young ones, um, but they've arrived home again. So we've we've become parents again, which is kind of sort of bizarre. So our young adults have moved back home. I collected my son from who came up from Canterbury on the day before the lockdown, which was kind of a bit of a relief. And my elder son has got um, who lives in residential care, just not just locally. He came home because we were very concerned about what was going to happen to him if we couldn't get to him, and he got got sick. So, and then at the same, so that was, and my elder, my daughter is working hard in Wellington. Um, she's in PR, and she's been writing all sorts of COVID-related material, including stuff for the Opportunities Party, which the, her, her company's got a contract with them. So it's all been very interesting, how you know, what's been happening to us. But I think we're all feeling like a little bit over it now, and we just like to kind of get a bit more variety in our days. It feels a bit like Groundhog Day, wouldn't you, if you've seen that movie, it's the same day over and over again, and uh, I think that's one of the things. I also ran the sheet milk conference for this year, which would have been at Lincoln online and via YouTube streaming, which was an enormous uh, success, actually. People really appreciated the fact that we managed to pull it off. So it was a day of presentations, mostly science-based rather than sort of uh, you know, more sort of farmer based, but the sheet milk conference went ahead. Didn't cost us very much, a thousand dollars to get some AV support, and uh, everyone who was keen to present did a really nice job. So that was a, a bit of a positive for us. I finished a report that I've been writing for MPI on the, some on the survey work I did, and um, and also painted the, my decks around the house over the weekend. So that was my kind of thing. As for other things, um, making lots of sheet milk smoothie. Um, I had about 40 litres of sheet milk in the freezer and I've just been making loads of smoothies for everyone. Um, and on Sunday, I actually um, performed at uh, a, an online pop-up music and arts festival, which was kind of cool, just in the lounge, plugged in, and um, it was all done via Facebook Live, which was kind of amazing. 
So I, I sort of feel like it's been sort of a few bits and bobs of things have been interesting, but also uh, kind of bit of work. And but overall, it's been quite a weird, a weird time where you know kids have arrived home and we've had um, had to deal with the sort of the, the the daily grind of just re rethinking how we go about living in this weird environment. Anyway, what am I working on? So I want to talk about scholarly business activism. And I guess what I'm trying to do here is theorize my own practice. And I want to argue that the um, this approach that I've been sort of developing may have may be helpful when it comes to thinking about the exit from um, or might be even I've said here an economic vaccine for a post pandemic world. Just a bit of kind of context, I guess. I mean, I, I, at the front of our study guides, there's this page, which I mean, we have to all include. And it says in it that we should be engendering impactful research of theoretical and practical significance. And I've often thought, okay, so how would we actually do that? If we took that seriously, what form would that take? Uh, engendering impactful research of theoretical and practical significance. So. I guess I'm trying to contribute to that in some way. I was also quite taken by the PVC's comments last week. Was it last week or the week before? Uh, I don't know, each day just seems like the same. Um, he said that we're facing a recession and that's definitely the case. Uh, he said that we'd have to reevaluate what is required of us. And I think that's an interesting an interesting phrase, um, reevaluate what is required of us. Um, we're, and we're not going back to business as usual anytime soon. And that is not simply just right going back to the office. I think business as usual is we're going to be, have to be kind of like thinking about how we change in the way we're operating. He argued that we're, what this may require is a significant change in our behavior, and we may have to push aside some of the boundaries which we have in place that tie us to particular forms of bureaucracy. And I think that may be just an invitation to, from us to throw forward things that might be of, of interest to the rest of the school. So I'm hoping in that context, what I'm gonna say is helpful. So here's a quick overview of what I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about um, what the universities have previously or historically done in times of crisis. Um, I wanna talk about where I think business research is now, what the COVID-19 deep freeze recession might look like. Uh, and if we were to intervene, what practices we might use, what precedents there are, how we might justify that, and how we might get started. So that's kind of just a general overview. Um, yeah, so there's, I can't actually see the comments at the moment from everyone. So um, uh, if you have comments, I will check them from time to time, but um, I'm just gonna rattle through and then hopefully have a discussion uh, towards the end and see how we go with that. Okay, so once upon a time, once, once upon another time, how did universities respond previously? There's not a huge amount of research, it seems to me, around this. Um, a lot of it is based on, in the US and the UK, but there's not a lot that's been said about how um, universities in Aotearoa responded to uh, particular crises. It seems that with the, the Great Recession of the 1929, the post-29 recession, there was a significant drop of incomes um, and that insight, you know, that created all sorts of challenges for universities. Um, there's a great story about how they, the university students would have to do all the gardening and do all the cleaning and everything in order to cover some of the costs. So that was, that's a kind of cool little story, which I think it tells us a lot about Massey at that particular time. Um, we said that definitely as the World War, you know, the World War II, there's quite a lot written about World War II and how uh, this involved both the scaling back of the institution, the provision of, of soldiers, obviously, and labor to the war effort. Um, that war effort uh, also in the US and UK particularly was a big boost to research. And you can trace some of the major, I guess, um, you know, in industrial research track trajectories from WW2, um, but also in social sciences. So there's some fantastic work on, you know, attempting to change people's food habits, factory management and rehabilitation uh, were, were key areas of work that went on in social science. But of course there was the Manhattan projects and the great science and technological sort of challenges of the time. Um, there in, in relation to New Zealand, there was a, there was a post-war education program which Massey was involved in when, uh, as part of the demobilizing service personnel. 
Um, but since then, this, there was, I think, of the, the financial crisis of 2008-9, there wasn't a huge amount of sort of direct intervention that the universities got sort of took in relation to that. Certainly, it did boost enrolments a little bit, um, and there was a sort of after-the-fact recession. But I, I, there was a little bit of criticism of universities that they didn't respond and haven't responded particularly well to, to that particular crisis. So I think there is a context here which we might pull out. What then, where is business research up to? And I just want to flick through this because this is this um there's a whole this is a whole area of work which I'm kind of fascinated by. But the one of the things I think that we have to appreciate is that universities are not sort of little islands that uh, can you know only talk to themselves. That actually they're beholden to various masters or what we might call sovereigns. And traditionally, you know the the great universities of the world were very beholden to the church. I mean, I was reading that apparently, you know, the, the UK universities, you had to be an Anglican to go to the major kind of the ancient universities in, in the UK. But of course, the state has provided, a, has been really the major sovereign for or master of the universities over the, the last sort of 200 years. Um, the professions, the corporations, and, and uh, to, to a degree that sort of major families have also been important in the um, the development of, of universities over the over the time. I guess the question then is what kind of masterly relational sovereign relation do they actually have? So the the argument, my argument here is that um, as the universities have been largely beholden to the state, then the state's interest in particular kinds of I guess um, knowledge of its citizenry, its boundaries, its the structure of of interventional techniques have been important. So I would argue that state-driven, what we might call surveillance or observational sciences, whether that's in economics or in, in all sorts of um, um, you know, sort of biological sciences or in, have been really important. And I think we can see that coming through now with the, the, the even some of the tensions between different branches of um, epidemiology and, and, and sort of biological sciences, you can see see that coming through. The state is, relies heavily on and therefore is, and the university is largely beholden to um, the state in relation to those particular type of, of interventional or observational sciences. But I think that this is also broader than that. Some of our research methodologies are connected to professions, which are obviously very important to parts of the university, but also more recently to corporate uh, entities that sit behind some of this particularly sort of public money uh, and that's created what I what we what I would call confessional sciences so our methodologies are, are both surveillance and confessional in in orientation so interpreting the desires and pleasures and futures of the people on behalf of a sovereign master whether that's a corporate the the, the state or the profession is kind of how I'd see that you are uh, hopefully I mean I, what I would suggest is that there's very little scope in those two particular forms for what I might call experimental or what I'm going to call action or activist types of intervention. And I think we're particularly poorly trained in develop in what you might call interventional sciences. Um, if you, university is a big thing, of course, it's not just a, um, a single, I'm not just talking about the social sciences. If you work in, say, in design in various technological areas, um, then you do have an interventional sort of like rationale and also an interventional sort of method, which is quite different from how we operate. So I think we're drawn much more towards these surveillance and confessional sciences, whereas our action or activist or interventionist angles uh, methods are poorly developed. So in that sense, I don't think we're particularly well suited or necessarily at the moment um, uh, able to easily make a contribution to some of the, the, the post-COVID-19 environment. But what kind of environment would that look like? Um, I want to see if I can play a little piece of, of video here. I've been trying to work out how you use Zoom for various things and um, I'm just going to switch over and see if this, this will play. Uh, sorry, just one one stick. Right, this this is what you would have to do if you're going to play some. So let's see if we can make this work. 
funds and also a lending facility there. Yeah. Oh, without doubt. I mean, the banks are critical infrastructure. They know their their role in society. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're in business. They want to make a profit. We want them to be profitable. But at the same time, I mean, holding capital is for exactly times like this to be deployed and used. They've got a really tough job. They, they are going to have to be allocating credit carefully across the economy to businesses that are as uncertain as everyone is and so they will have to make uh, important judgments but with the banks you know we've, we've negotiated very quickly the mortgage holiday a rolling loan gathers no loss so um, you know they're able to provide um, liquidity to households and likewise the government uh, finance uh, business finance lending scheme is a great initiative uh, we've opened up a term lending facility so the banks can borrow money from us in order to go off and do their their lending um, so yet another the form of just working together, making sure that they can do their job. They're in every household, every business in the country. They have the reach, we don't. So that means they can do some lending that might otherwise have been just too risky for them to take on? I think they're going to have to be, they will be very challenged. You know, they're going to have to make uh, calls around uh, at what point is this uh, a liquid versus insolvent? And, you know, across not only just the Reserve Bank, but all the regulators as well, we've been working hard to make it easier for banks to make those calls uh, so that, you know, the blame storming at, at the end of all of this doesn't, you know, continue for too long. We know these are unusual times. We're saying cash flow this place as best you can for the time being as the situation evolves. But we don't run a zero failure regime here in New Zealand. You know, companies, uh, some will go, some will struggle through with good assistance, others will flourish. Likewise, the financial system. I mean, we're going to see a huge reshaping of the economy. It seems fairly inevitable now, I guess, in the the next months and, and, and years potentially. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you'll see aggregation in some sectors. You'll see new businesses uh, uh, coming uh, to the fore. You'll see ownership changes happening across uh, businesses. It's going to be a very dynamic period. And I know we all come out. We were very smart people, very innovative going into this. We'll be the same coming out. Okay, so um, that's the governor of the New Zealand, the Reserve Bank, um, Adrian Orr his assessment that was actually last week so things may have sort of shifted a little bit but i thought it would just gives us a very quick indication of where we might be looking and of course anyone that's been paying attention will have noted that we've had some kind of interesting flight failures over the last few days and uh, it's going to it highlights the fact that we are heading into a period of um you know, relatively high unemployment and underemployment in some areas as well. And, you know, the failure of, of Burger King, the media environment, Sea New Zealand and, and all and all the ancillary related, you know, jobs and areas and, and suppliers in those areas are going to be hit pretty hard. Um, so what are, what kind of impact would that potentially have? Um, I think what one of the things that we're going to face is there's going to be some highly skilled job seekers out there. And some of them are going to be suffering some quite sort of traumatic having had quite traumatic experiences. So not just sitting at home like you and I and and not having to worry too much about what the future looks like, but actually being quite traumatized by the fact that their idealized job, their work, their career has been reshaped by, you know, the loss of of quite significant chunks of of their identity, quite significant chunks of their life and potentially having to rethink that. But at, at the same time, and I'm thinking back here to the um, the, the, the the dairy industry recession of, of or when the dairy price dropped out in the sort of 2012, 2013, 2014 period, I had quite a lot to do with um, farmers who were struggling at that point. And I think what it highlighted for me is that there is a kind of um, rethinking and reshaping process that goes on for people where they look to kind of they bring out things which they have previously taken um, maybe put aside as opportunities and have sort of investigated them to see whether they can kind of jump sideways or move in different directions so as well as them facing some quite traumatic experiences I think they also were able to rethink how they approached you know the future of their 
you know, life, job, career, um, identity. I think the other thing we have to bear in mind, there's going to be significant sort of underused or undervalued assets, resources, and factors of production around. Um, when you think about, say, tourism, you know, I can imagine, I don't know how many there are, there's probably 10,000 um, camper vans sitting in idle right now, it's somewhere in various parts of New Zealand, whether that's Queenstown or Auckland Airport or Christchurch Airport, you know, and you think about all the airliners and all the sort of resources, and these are, you know, these are going to be sort of basically locked down and for the next, probably the next year at least. So there's, there are opportunities to think about how you might uh, think through people's having to reconsider re-recognize themselves in new ways, um, can significantly under, underused or undervalued resources, which, you know, there's going to be some fighting over, but um, we should sort of think about that. Now, that's, in my view, um, what seemed to happen during the, the dairy industry sort of price collapse in 2013, 2014, is that undervalued and some undervalued resources were picked up by others. Um, people refocused and reconnected to certain previous things. And in my case, when I looked at when I look at the sort of the development of the sheep milk industry since 2013, 2014, it was an in dire straits, but actually the the um, the recession really helped that that process. So those are some of the sort of just initial ideas about how we might go about intervening. So what what the conditions which might surround that. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about now is is me trying to theorize uh, a, a mode of interventional practice and I haven't really put in some of the sort of the, the case materials but let me just run through this and hopefully it's visible I'm not sure probably the, the words are a bit small so one of the things we should do is we should begin by first connecting with a, what we might what I call a practitioner activist those that are in industries or have, can, who are finding themselves without jobs without um, you know if they're Career, seem, career path seems to have been altered dramatically and are looking for new opportunities. So it's really starting with the problem of the practitioner activist. So it's building those connections, familiarizing themselves with the, with the sort of with what, what's going on for them. You then have to kind of, in my view, symbolize the problem, not just as a personal issue, but rather as a generalized um, issue, something which uh, it can, you can help people to think about how this changes their, their relations of desire, that is how they can connect to new sort of idealized selves, and what might that community, what, what kind of work might go into actually creating a community or a group response to that. Um, for example, let's say somebody finds they've, they've lost their jobs in the airlines or media or the telecoms area, um, but at the same time, they're not without capital with perhaps even a little bit of equity in certain forms, and that might form the basis of a, a different direction. So they might think, well, I've always wanted to do X or Y. Um, I'd like to be able to create something new. I feel like you know this would be a huge gap for me, and I want to sort of go. So it's about connecting with those groups and just really out, out, outlining what I think, what they might be um, interested in. And from that, devising a kind of, seeing whether there's a community, you could form a community or a network or a, at least a, a group around it to actually pursue this new direction. And I'm not trying to lay out where that might be, whether that's in agricultural new forms of of um, sort of mediated uh, learning or whether it's in, you know, sort of, Anyway, just there's lots and lots of potential there. Um, and then once you've kind of formed that group or connected with that group, it's really important, I think, to draft, this is raft, drive a, dr a set of interventions. And these are really just exploratory interventions where you're trying to work out how you how that group forms, what its modes of engagement might be, how that, um, and what kind of role you can play in forming those networks. So conferences, workshops, meetings, websites, podcasts, courses, resource sheets, networking events, all these sorts of things, which give people a sense that actually there's a post post COVID-19 um, world for them where they can kind of engage with the things that they're interested in or the, or the whether that's organizationally or more interventions or, or responses. And at that point, I think the university has a role, it has a role in what I call creating a battery of signifiers. And that is really just forming a, a compelling uh, uh, cachet of of statements claims supported you know by sort of related research which you can then use to sort of stabilize and legitimize something which might help people to connect and 
I'm going to give you a little example I'm working on, but I'm, I'm, over the next few years, I want to work on the development of a seaweed industry in New Zealand, moving it from being something which people just, you know, try and step over on the beach into something which is realised as safe, nutritious, fast growing, great for carbon capture, beneficial for the ocean, and something which locally has very distinctive characteristics and we don't need to carry on importing Chinese, Korean or Japanese seaweed. We can actually do things, interesting things with it here. So that's kind of what, and there's, there's existing group around this with its scientists or what so it's really about forming those those communities and that's where the university plays a really powerful interventionalist role because it carries with it if you like um, a mode of engagement with a sovereign which is supportive of that so rather than thinking of ourselves as simply being if you like beholden to the state we can become beholden to a community or a network which we ourselves can actually begin to form and to structure and to support so that's what I mean by locate the bazaar with the new emerging sovereign and then restructure that into a legitimate form of engagement um, in, a, in, in, a, in a network and a community which people can then articulate as an, ident as an initial identity or initial idea about how they might go forward in a post-COVID environment. We then, then it's important to using some of these interventional techniques to re-signify that new entrant as an entrepreneur or a pioneer or as enterprising and then to, to build, because the university has a kind of particular place in the sort of media landscape in what we might call in the symbolization landscape if the pushing out that symbolized structure for, for people. I mean, that's really its job. Its job is to create symbols and statements which kind of legitimize and structure up the unknown into ways that you can kind of like talk about it. So that's kind of the job of resignifying the new entrant in this you know, new space as an entrepreneur or a pioneer. So that's kind of how I would think about an interventional strategy in, 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 in that sense. So are there examples of how you might go about doing this? So the argument here is that you're moving from doing what I'm what I call balcony science to to really find to work out what the business will can do, what it, what kind of experimental action or interventional sciences um, science we might undertake. And I've got just a couple of really quick examples here. I was really taken recently by uh, the work of um, anthropology PhD at Massey. So she, rather than sort of you know um, simply kind of I mean, typically the anthropologists have been great at doing ethnographies. Well, what she did was an activist ethnography where she simply she set up a second-hand baby clothes exchange website, and and her and her PhD is really written about that intervention, how she went about it, what was involved, how she had to restructure the way in which she engaged with people, and the whole and the, so it's a whole enterprise that she set up as part of this and that became her PhD. So it's kind of that's the kind of interventional strategies which I think you know business research should be good at and I think we should be kind of much more better at doing that kind of work and calling it research. I mean what is research? It's it's detailed inquiry into a particular area where you're trying to understand a problem. Yeah, so we know what the problem is. Well, the method, the, the question is, what is the appropriate method? And my argument is that actually our methods have been largely tied to particular institutional benefactors, whereas what the argument I'm putting here is that we should be inventing our benefactors or inventing our sovereigns as part of this process of intervention. There's some fantastic work on Kaupapa Māori educational institutions. Um, and Graham Smith, the reason why he's such an amazing character is he's wrote, he wrote and was very much involved in um, the setting up of some of these amazing uh, institutional forms, um, Kahanga Reo, um, Kura, um, the, the Wanangas, these are all important uh, interventional strategies which are really at core uh, key to Kaupapa Māori research. Um, there's a couple of other examples here, I'm not sure I've got time to sort of talk about them previously. Uh, a couple of years ago I, I met some South American academics who were doing some what I thought was amazing work. They'd set up this self-help work um, website which on the face of it looked like just sort of you know you know, sort of those sort of crass sort of advice to people on how to improve their well-being. Um, but actually what it was doing was helping women to, you know, come to terms with, you know, and find ways of exiting sort of violent and oppressive domestic circumstances. So there's, there are particular strategies which they'd worked out that on the face of it looked like it was just like people being kind of, you know, 
you know, jolly with one another, but actually it had a much more serious uh, interventional sort of method underneath it. Exten the extensionist is, this is a great paper by Esper et al. Uh, it looks at how academics worked really closely with Brazilian um, workers in a, um, and there's been a huge, I mean, as you know, the Brazilian economy has been all over the shop, but the, um, these academics worked really closely with workers when the workers took over factories as part of a, in a consequence of a downturn, and they acted to help organise production, deal with the government, protect against banks and all sorts of things like that. So there's been some interesting work published around these sort of interventional strat strategies, which I, I think is worth following up on, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer that a little bit. Um, I should have just going forward here. So I just want to do very f one or two minutes on my own sort of engagement with this activist scholarship sort of approach. I'm going to talk briefly about the sheep milk industry and some of you have heard this before, but um, I, it just seems to me I need to kind of like support this by saying something about what I've been doing. Okay, so as I said, the first thing is to start with a practitioner activist. Who are the key people in the network and how can you kind of connect with them? What you can, what, how can you support them? So back in 2013, I visited Kingsmead, which is one of the, at that time, only one of four sheep milk operators in New Zealand, find out what their problems was, found out they couldn't get other farmers to, to, to contract supply, then thought, well, what are the ways in which we could sort of build a community around that in order to help solidify this sheep milk is a particular sort of viable option for, for farmers. Um, we did, then developed a bunch of interventional techniques, including running conferences, connected up with Hag Research, got involved with some research grants, and then kind of developed what I'd call the sort of the battery of signifiers. So we, we, we pulled all the massive resources together we could. We ran national field day stands, lots of student groups, created a university kind of like collaborative group and a vehicle for running all this sort of things. And then did a whole bunch of outreach stuff. So lots of workshops around the country, visiting key people and, and formed a kind of a, uh, you know, an initial community great group, which then helped to promote the industry into, into sort of, um, uh, websites and, and news stories and features and all kinds of things. The farming press then got on board and really started to go for it, which was massively important. Um, we then did some interesting work with what I call sort of locating the bazaar with a new sovereign. So really thinking about how the new consumer engages with non-bovine milks, basically having the sort of health novelty and protest sort of signifies and then use Massey's expertise in food science to get involved in that. And since then, I've just been doing more sort of Oops, um, supportive work really, I guess, um, you know, news stories and features and running awards and various things like that. So we're, we're kind of, uh, hopefully I've kind of demonstrated that you can kind of do something different. I mean, I would say that it's had a bit of an impact on how I uh, ch have changed the way I think about doing academic work. And it's also, I guess, um, I have to say, I've, it's been good that Macy's supported this, well, reluctantly at some areas, but it's been, it's been certainly possible to work in this way in the university. But how would you substantiate this as a form of activist scholarship? I mean, if you go back to, to Kurt Lewin, who was really the, the godfather of action research, um, there's some tremendous resources and, and, a, and a very strong line of, of support from that, you know, going coming forward right through to various forms of action research. Um, I use much more heavily the Lacanian idea that that psychoanalysis should take place outside the clinic. So have been trying to, the business researcher in my view works as an analyst, testing out new ways to reroute desire. That is a sort of a desire and a sort of uh, individual and group and community sense to establish new master signifiers, i.e. sheep milk was the example there, and to kind of reroute people's sense of what's possible um, using the university as its kind of core institutional support. Um, Karen Barad's work on agentic realism is really helpful. Basically, her argument there is research is not just a practice of attempting to represent the real, actually, it should be a set of actions that perform the world in new ways. So this re agentic realism is, I think, a really good line of, of, of work if you want to sort of get into that. And of course, coming back to good old, um, um, I just forgot what his first name was, uh, Schumpeter, um, what was his first name? It's not Carl, was it? No. Um, oh, oh, you guys are probably on top of this. Joseph, thank you. <laughs> 
some kind of special combinational importance. So if you read Schumpeter, you realize that what he's, what he's trying to theorize is this whole, um, this, this new performance uh, and, and the value which comes from that. So I think there are various strands of work that you could use theoretically to kind of enhance and develop this kind of activity. So how do we start? What's, what are the key things? Here's my little list of to-dos. Identify the area. Revise the problem as a community response. Devise some interventions, yeah? And um, from that, you know, I would say the important thing here is that just for the university to see itself as, as a gift, uh, you know, rather than taking from others in order to support its research activity, rather it sees itself as, as giving to others in ways that enhance other people's action. So it's quite, it changes the kind of orientation of research. It's a very much a gifting relation and gifts obviously create off opportunities for reciprocity. Um, and I think that confirms the kind of community relations that you should, that we get involved in. Really, and mobilizing the university, you know, the university is, and people are not going to be happy about this, is a very rich uh, institution, rich not just in money, but actually in time. People have tremendous amounts of discretionary time. And if you find, if you can, it's quite, I, I think it's really possible to find a group of supportive colleagues across the university, not just in, in the business school, who are, who can be, who easily find time to be interested in new and to some degree bizarre areas of activity. So it's, we can, we can work with that. So identify your area, find the key practitioners, revise the problem as a community response, devise some interventions, and then mobilize the university in support of that, re-signify the new entrant as an entrepreneur, as an enterprising subject, and then develop those interventions as you're going through. So they have a kind of a curve in my view. There's the initial push, then there's a the sort of things start to get moving and then as towards the end you're really stabilizing and intervening intervening and i think for me the the mpi um survey which i just completed a final report on last week or a couple of weeks ago is really part of that overall interventional sort of strategy and finally develop your method as you go this sounds her heretic you know like heresy doesn't it that you actually should develop your own method rather than you know, follow someone else's. But, and I think that's the creativity of the university and it's there so provided you can find a sovereign, a myth, a master in order to support this work. So develop your method as you go. Keep a journal, a diary, an archive, everything. Periodically theorize that, theorize your own activities and connect that to key inspirational sources, Barad, Lacan, Lewin, Butler, etc. So that's kind of my method of approach in terms of trying to justify this from an academic perspective. Okay, that's me. Um, thanks for listening. Hope you're all keen to get started now. There's lots of other areas which I've sort of jumped over and 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 would have liked to have talked more about. Um, the last one there is one which has kind of fascinated me is that universities, universe of interventions, we actually, Massey has a history of, of activist research, particularly in agriculture, but uh, in other areas as well. And I think that's something we can be a bit, bit proud of. Uh, it's a little bit hidden, but we can say a bit more about that if uh, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more about if, if I had time. So thanks very much, guys. I'm um, hopefully that's, that's help, been helpful. That's I think about 30 minutes. So awesome. Um, I think we can probably use the, I'll just uh, stop the share and go to um, the chat area probably. Cool, thank you. All right, that was that was really cool. Quite enjoyed that. I quite like learning what people are doing. It's, it gives a nice overview. And I do, I um, must admit, I was wondering where you would bring in Lacan and sheep milk. I was just <laughs> waiting for that. But you didn't let me down, you didn't no. let me down. No, no. Um, so people, feel free. Just uh, unmute, unmute your uh, microphone if you want to speak, and uh, away you go. I'll just turn off mine. Um, can I um, can I pitch in? Absolutely, pitch pitch ahead. <laughs> Um, so I have d dabbled in this in the past and um, I found it quite difficult in a way to find um, a suitable uh, platforms for research outputs in, in you know, taking this kind of approach. And one of the, one of the fields I ended up um, in is the, is the monitoring and evaluation field uh, just because you can document that learning process quite nicely and mm -hmm. they're, they're interested in that sort of thing. So that's just sort of a, a tip for you if, you, um, if, if that's something that you are interested in. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Anna. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I must admit I've been publishing mostly handbook chapters for the last few years and haven't, and that gives you an enormous amount of freedom to to write the things that you want to write about. Um, I did write publish a piece in an organization called it's, um, it's Time for Acting Up. So that was really uh, thinking, trying to think this through. So I was the editor of the organization for five years and um, that helped me to both get entirely pissed off with the conventional uh, academic publishing um, environment and at the same time helped me to think through what I think are some of the possibilities. Um, and so certain journals such as Organisation, I think, have, have, have responded to that. So they're working on um, new formats, um, whether that's in a sort of, you know, reflection type space or whether that's in a new, uh, new writing practice space or whether it's in a uh, reporting, you know, interventional practice. Um, so I think some of the more progressive journals are progressive in a you know they're not never progressive but you know some of them are actually trying to work through some of these these challenges so that they just simply don't carry on publishing the same stuff i think um if i was to look at the the history of publishing more generally is that the, what tends to happen is that a group forms and then they publish a journal which really publishes work that they are keen to do. So I'd look at something like um, the Journal of Applied Behavioral Science, which is kind of died a little bit in the last few years, but it's it started out very much as a uh, an intervention focused um, academic journal. Human Relations were way back, had a very, very strong interventionalist focus. Um, yeah, but some of the others are much more conservative in that in that regard but yeah so thanks for that i mean i haven't looked at all at the the audit and um uh, evaluation areas uh, but so yeah maybe that that's a good good place to go um to be honest uh publishing really it's it's part of a much broader problem than i think we have we we have a an over focus on publication and we an under focus on other types of outputs. So, for example, I've been work I've worked quite closely with the guys from um, in the food tech area and the food engineering area. And so, for them, you know, they could write you know eighteen hundred to two thousand words on a particular experiment they did. You'll know, have ten authors in it. It will take them their their maximum contribution to that would be maybe a day's work. And the, you know that the focus is on the experimental work and their production of sort of new technology. So this group I've been working with, they've just got their patent out, you know, and they've worked really closely with a manufacturer to produce this new technology. So it's very action intervention focused. Whereas I've always struggled with the fact that we are not encouraged or thought to be interventionist, like not to go out and set up, say, an organisation. I mean. Surely you and I, we could form, you know, possibly using some of the ideas I've just thrown around, um, an organization based around sort of uh, post COVID-19 um, interventions in tourism or post tourism or in, you know, in, in carbon sequestration and, and, you, and actually see that organization as an output, as a, as a thing. Um, which has a life of its own, which have a, which over time would, you know, would form a, uh, a resource that would, you know, reproduce some kind of impact. So, the, the the experimental and impact and interventionist strategies which I'm proposing are really based around producing different types of output away from simply publication. I mean, a publication is helpful as a legitimizing strategy, um, but it's post after the fact most of the time it's an archival technique rather than a an output which has any necessary value in its own right and again i think what's why we're so tied to a publication strategy is that we're beholden to the state which has an interest in um, particular kinds of observational uh, desires and the state is a is is our as it continues to be our major benefactor as a consequence it it puts certain kind of you know funding trajectories in place in order to con confirm that role i have to say though i think the funding trajectory is becoming is being undermined you may have noted in the um, college of sciences report that ray gore put together for in relation to um, digital plus uh, that 
actually the College of Science PBRF performance had been going up, but the actually the funding had been going down. So we, we, I think we've reached, we will reach at some point a crisis point where particular kinds of um, traditional publishing activity is seen as largely unsustainable because it's not returning the kind of um, uh, funding support that was, is hoped. Just a little note on funding. The sheep milk industry project which I've been running has turned over more than a half a million dollars in the last five years. And it, it made about $36,000 last year in surpluses. So this is not this is not different from a funding strategy. You can, I think it's possible to form communities and groups through and use, use various um, you know, exchange or sort of um, monetizing for processes in order to support not only that community, but also to justify and support the work that we're doing. So it doesn't have to be, you know, funding doesn't have to come from the big grant or the, from the state or wherever. Funding, you can actually generate funds quite successfully, I think, by doing this kind of interventional work. The frustration I've had over the last whoever, you know, five years is that the university doesn't recognize this multiple sourced revenue streams that you have to create in order to generate that kind of cash. So we did $120,000 worth of business last year. We generated, you know, over $20,000 in earnings. And, you know, and the university still thinks it's a waste of, from an accounting perspective, still thinks it's a waste of activity. Could I share an anecdote on the back of that? Sure. Um, so I sent out an email to the school a few months back about a, a video that someone had made about publishing and the benefits that publishing houses get from our, our work, which is publicly funded, but they gain exponential resources from. The anecdote is that that video was created at a, at a university Clarks in upstate New York, which is primarily a technological engineering university. So that video was created by the Department of Communication on, the, on a shoestring budget. It's not really a high quality video. It's kind of crappy. It's too long. There's too many bits and pieces that need fixing. Anyway, that went, video went public. If you take all of the publications and all of the citations of that university, all of them, from these engineers and scientists, you multiply it by four, that equates to the number of citations that, that one crappy video has had over, since its creation. Right. In other words, <laughs> our work, we're paid peanuts for it. Publishing houses get exponential benefits from it, but even then it's not, it's not of benefit to anybody apart from the publishing house. Yeah. So finding new forms of publication, i.e. video, um, may be a way that we can go that circumvents some of these um, some of these uh, fish hooks. Yeah, and no, I agree with you, Ralph. I mean, we the whole discussion around publisher profits is, you know, I think we had a couple of years ago, and and it was driven by the libraries saying they couldn't possibly continue to pay the the sorts of um, prices that the big else, the corporate publishers, Elsevier, um, and others were. Were, were demanding for these products which were written by academics and and you know that's another angle on on the the re, one of the reasons why i think the corporate state interface you know works so well to then become as the as the dominant sovereign or the master of the university sitting behind all the, the bureaucratic machinery which then have to produce in order to justify it so um but you know, at the moment, I guess they've the publishers have pulled back, and they haven't been increasing, you know, journal pricing at the at the rate which um, um, which they um, had had been. So I think there's a little bit of a sort of way way point at the moment. Good mm. point, though. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think part of the the issue here is not just the uh, publishing thing. Uh, the the academics themselves get identity and value through publishing and sure. uh, a lot of academics uh, live for it and yeah. and uh, their egos are uh, fueled by it um, one of the ways that the, the what reason we get funded the way we do is because the government finds it easy to fund us by uh, publication it's much harder to fund us by impact 
and impact is loosely used throughout our industry as meaning publications when impact is, is, is actually what we really should be aiming for, is how do we affect the society in which we live, not how many, you know, <laughs> how many five people read, read, a, read a journal article. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a wider issue. And I think your, your ideas are, are very sound. I, I, I quite like the idea that uh, we, we look towards impact rather than towards publishing. Um, and there's very many ways to do that. It doesn't necessarily have to result in funding flows. No. Uh, yeah, it's just a, 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 there's, we can't solve that problem. Uh, we can start it, but we certainly can't solve it because it, yeah. it, it's, it's, it goes much wider than, than our little group here. Yeah, yeah. but we, we, we have to be able to, I mean, it's, it's been important for me to be able to tell, um, you know, the, the hierarchy that uh, this is generating funds, which then I can use to spend on continuing the project. If it was simply a draw on existing, you know, school of management funds, they would have chopped it off years ago. And so being able to generate, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year to fund other dimensions of this was important. So I don't think we should not do funding. I think we should see funding as part of developing um, uh, the impact that we're involved in. Just um, another couple of points. Um, I, so I'm not sure. Have you people got any ideas about how they would, you know, what what kind of responses do you think we should be engaged in, in, in the post uh, COVID-19 environment. Um, I mean, there's going to be a lot of slack resources laying around and a lot of people looking for, you know, new opportunities, new things that they could be doing. You know, 400 pilots stacking shelves at, at Countdown isn't a kind of a great use of, high, you know, highly skilled um, um, workers. Um, is there a, is there something we should do in that area? I mean, what about the tourism industry? Gosh, yeah. I mean, it's Kia ora, Kia ora Craig. It's, it's surely here. I've just got a comment. You're, you're talking, and, and I think I've heard others say, the post-COVID-19 crisis. I don't actually think we are in that position yet. I think we're still in the middle of it. Um, and so are you talking six months out or next week? Well, I, I mean, so let's assume that the number of cases of new infections hit zero over the next, sometime in the next couple of weeks, and the decision is then made to, re, you know, to reshape the lockdown processes. Um, mm -hmm. In the meantime, though, you know, the the number on of people seeking. Um, you know, sort of the, the dole and various other sort of support is, is on the rise. So, mm -hmm. you know, every day we're seeing new, you know, Burger King have shut all their 60 stores. Yeah. Um, the You know, um, all of the, news, the, the newspapers have, have cut back. Air New Zealand has basically been grounded. Um, mm -hmm. The tourism industry, which flows from that, is, is locked down and is unlikely to go anywhere for the next year. The, mm -hmm. um, all the related uh, hospitality businesses are going to be, a re which are tourism connected, uh, are going to be struggling. There's going to be thousands and thousands of ho hotel motel rooms are going to be empty over for at least another year. So what mm -hmm. I mean by the post COVID uh, environment is the economic kind of impact of this um, from both shutting borders, um, you know, restricting people's movements and, you know, dramatically reducing the amount of activity that people are generating. Mm -hmm. I mean, people will feel like they're a little bit wealthier because they literally haven't spent anything in the last, you know, month. Um, and so, and there's a sort of a general rethinking of funding, of spending, I think, that's going on as well. Mm. Mm. Okay, Kia ora. Okay. Just a, a question about sort of the re-evolution of the practitioner activist, and I think, you're right, there's going to be heaps of resources that are going to have to recreate themselves. Uh, but we do have some really good lessons from that in, in things like even migrants like myself, who had to sort of recreate, I had to quit being a specialist and become a generalist when I moved to New Zealand, because there's not enough room for me to be a specialist here. There's not enough income for that. Mm -hmm. So can we 
look at using this, I'm gonna call it untapped workforce, skilled workforce, um, to create income? And should we, in a position of power as people with jobs, not be the people helping be the catalyst for it? Because we can, we can feel that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Well, well, people, we're fast approaching the end of our little chat uh, on COVID-19 and what the business schools and universities can do about that. Um, thank you very, very much for your time. And thank you, Craig, for a very entertaining uh, hour. It's been good. There's been a fair bit of discussion. Um, I would like to put out a general call now to anyone who would like to present their own ideas. You can see that's not really hard. Uh, you just speak on what it is that you're working on. Uh, so there's nothing to prepare. It's just, this is what I'm doing. Um, if you'd like to send me those uh, through and hopefully we might be able to get a, a list so that we can build up maybe two or three months uh, in advance. I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks we will be able to maybe uh, be released from our house arrest and, and move around a little bit more. That, that could inspire people to come up with ideas. Um, and if you could send me your ideas, I'll just uh, book them up. But in the meantime, um, thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, I hope you're all having a, 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 a splendid time in house arrest and uh, hopefully it won't last for too much longer. Thanks very much. Have a good Thanks, week. Andrew. All the best. Bye. Cheers, guys.